This is purely a journalistic point of view. Nothing more has been said in this video other than that of which has been reported by various media sources and backed up with sources seen at the end of this video. Wrestling is known for its racist angles and grossly insensitive portrayal of minorities, so it should come as no surprise minorities have complained about unequal treatment both in and out of the ring. World Championship Wrestling was rocked by a lawsuit claiming racial discrimination in terms of pushes and pay, as well as a culture of racism behind closed doors. However, was there any substance to these claims? Join us now for part 2 of Behind the Titantron's examination of the WCW Racism Lawsuit. As we discussed last time around, the lawsuit revolved around allegations of discrimination and a hostile workplace environment due to racism by WCW officials. How did the plaintiff's attorneys go about proving this? A review of court documents shows the detailed case presented against the defendants. Keep in mind the case was settled and the information we present is based on documents filed in support of the case. The lawsuit included sworn statements from various individuals about their experiences in WCW. In Exhibit A, African American wrestler Rick Reeves stated under oath that when he inquired about employment with Terry Taylor, he was told, we enough of y'all already. Reeves declared he asked Jody Hamilton about employment and was told, we've got enough of your kind down here. Non-wrestlers stated they observed discrimination and racism also. In Exhibit D, Referee Johnny Boone, aka John Snowowski, affirmed he heard Terry Taylor call Sony Ono a j and a g. Taylor reportedly also called Ernest the Cat Miller and Hardbody Harrison n. Boone alleged less talented wrestlers such as Joey Maggs and Sherry Martell were pushed, while Hardbody Harris, Bobby Walker, and Miller, all African American, were not. He also alleged Colonel Robert Parker was paid more than non white Sony Ono. Boone alleges that WCW officials used the word nigger. According to Boone, he heard Vince Russo and Terry Taylor discuss a lawsuit by Bobby Walker and Hardbody Harris, insinuating Booker T's WCW Championship win over Jeff Jarrett was made to deflect the lawsuit. Wrestler Bobby Walker stated in Exhibit P that he observed what he felt was unequal treatment of white and African American wrestlers. Walker stated under oath that he saw Willie Worthen train at the WCW power plant, working hard and committing himself to showing up every day. Nonetheless, Worthen did not receive a contract, while white wrestlers such as Joey Maggs received contracts, despite not showing up for training every day. In addition to the racist comments, there were observations of discriminatory hiring practices. In Exhibit E, WCW stage coordinator Moses Williams declared under oath how Doug Dillinger said there would never be a black security officer and there never was. Williams noted WCW only had one black truck driver and she was fired for a minor incident as opposed to two white drivers who were retained after accidents that caused much more damage. He testified that a WCW production manager preferred to hire people if they were Jewish and noted a WCW official remarked that an employee who had married a black woman would have problems because their kids were half black. Williams alleges Vince Russo said wrestling is a white man's sport and that as long as he was running things, he wanted a white champion. In Williams' statement, Russo also reportedly referred to people as blacks, j s or backs. Williams states he did not protest the discrimination, but he observed black wrestler Pez Watley do so. And in Williams' opinion, Watley was punished by a lack of push, lack of training and demotion to setting up the ring. Williams noticed discrimination against Asian and Hispanic wrestlers, noting Sony Ono was not an employee while Jimmy Hart was. Williams also stated he believed whites performing the same work as him were paid more. In his statement, he recalled how his lack of complaining led to him being called a good he also noted Doug Dillinger gave out promotional gifts and souvenirs to white children 
but not to black children. Other office employees made sworn statements about the lack of diversity in WCW. In Exhibit I, Brenda Smith, power plant training coordinator, declared she worked in WCW in several capacities and knew of the racial identities of WCW employees. According to Smith, WCW never had an African American as a senior management or executive position. Pamela Collins, WCW call center coordinator, stated in Exhibit J that she noticed a lack of diversity in WCW. Discriminatory treatment was found among WCW employees working in its merchandise warehouse. Exhibit K contains a statement from warehouse worker Catherine Neal about discrimination by her white boss. She testified the boss treated blacks differently than whites. She noted a white employee received more overtime than others, did not have to sign in and out of work, and security searched black employees, but not white ones. She raised complaints with a supervisor, but does not believe anything was done to remedy the situation. The lawsuit contained copies of letters from wrestler Bobby Walker to WCW executives Eric Bischoff and Dr. Harvey Schiller dated 1st March 1998 asking for a meeting about Terry Taylor's racist remarks and Walker's dismissal. These letters found in exhibits B and C arguably would go towards showing WCW was aware of the allegations concerning a hostile work environment. Exhibit F contained a supplemental report by Dr. David W. Rasmussen, breaking down WCW's use of blacks as wrestlers. Rasmussen stated the average availability of blacks for wrestling was 25%. His report indicated African Americans were underrepresented, based on the observations of several people involved with the WCW power plant. Longtime wrestler and booker Ole Anderson shared his experiences in wrestling, particularly his role as a booker in WCW. In Exhibit H, Anderson, who had booked in Georgia Championship Wrestling, noted WCW used to draw a substantial black audience and he believed that this was partly due to booking black wrestlers such as the Junkyard Dog. Anderson discussed wanting to bring in Thunderbolt Patterson, a known draw. Anderson commented WCW's Jim Hurd repeatedly asked him what favours he owed Thunderbolt. He also noted WCW paid black wrestlers less than white wrestlers. He noted WCW's decline in attendance over time and the absence of a black audience. Anderson stated he felt Ron Simmons and Butch Reed became WCW Tag Team Champions due to rumours there might be a discrimination lawsuit, particularly after Rocky King voiced dissatisfaction. Anderson's deposition contains testimony about Mid-South Wrestling owner and promoter Bill Watts, providing a bit of humour in the court papers. Now, Bill Watts, was he a white male? Yeah. Is he a white male? Yes. Still is. Anderson testified about black wrestlers being main event players and selling out arenas during his time in wrestling. However, he observed WCW stop using black wrestlers in such roles to the extent they used to. Anderson says he noticed a big drop off in black fans attending WCW events, presumably because the company didn't push as many African American wrestlers. He noted the disparate treatment of problematic Lex Luger to JYD, noting Luger was an unreliable worker, failing to make shows while JYD was reliable. Despite these differences, Luger received a much higher salary than the dog and received a bigger push. Plaintiff's attorneys relied on the testimony of Sergeant Steve Hicks, a law enforcement officer, but more importantly, a wrestling journalist and the book's Ultimate History of Pro Wrestling and the Ultimate Pro Wrestling Book of Lists Volume 1 and 2. Plaintiff's attorneys relied upon Hicks as an expert witness and in Exhibit L, he noted Bobby Walker had as much excitement, charisma, uniqueness, crowd appeal and stage presence as many Caucasian wrestlers who received a significantly greater push from WCW. He noted Walker's lack of push and described how Walker received lesser pushes than Chris Canyon and Alex Wright. Hicks also relied upon his detailed notes about WCW's world champion and matches to show an underrepresentation of minority wrestlers. In Exhibit S, Steve Hicks observed WCW's World Championship reigns from its first black champion Ron Simmons on 14th July 1991 through the first lawsuit on the 11th of February 2000. During this time, WCW had a black champion 150 out of the 3,286 days. He noted black and Asian wrestlers' use at pay-per-views and stated he believed that they were underrepresented, thus proving racism. 
He noted figures from pay-per-view events from 1994 through 2001. For example, from 1994 to 2001, Super Bowl had a 9.13% of black wrestlers and 2.88% of Asian wrestlers. Hicks' status as an expert witness raises the hypothetical of whether other figures in the so-called wrestling journalism community might have been called in as expert witnesses. Also, would Hicks's detailed records of wrestling matches been enough to qualify him as an expert witness at trial? Hicks' statements would likely have been used in support of a report found in Exhibit T. In it, David Rasmussen, statistician and professor of economics at Florida State University, used statistical analysis to determine whether African Americans were hired in representation to their qualified employment pool. Rasmussen stated the standard is how far the proportion of paid African Americans strayed from what is considered a racially neutral figure. The calculation is determined by the actual number of African Americans hired, the total number of persons hired, and the expected proportion of African Americans among these hires. Rasmussen stated a chilling effect, i.e. a knowledge an employer is biased, might lower the number of African Americans applying. Thus, he had to find a similar industry to establish a reliable standard. Rasmussen then compared wrestling to another industry which requires excellent athletic ability, physical strength, size and be able to follow a highly scripted sequence of events. Pro Football Blacks account for 67 of the people in football. Rasmussen stated the power plant hired 228 persons from 1996 to 2000. By his standard, 30.6 would have been hired, but only 17 African Americans were. By Rasmussen's report, WCW's hiring of African Americans was statistically lower than it should have been. Rasmussen also analyzed the time it took for wrestlers to reach elite salary status and noted African Americans took longer than whites. The odds of this happening by chance were less than 1 in 100, according to Rasmussen. One of WCW's defences was a wrestler's push is subjective rather than objective, something which is not discriminatory by itself. It stated it had a legitimate, non-discriminatory reason for its complaint of actions, that of budgetary constraints. It stated Ross received higher pay than 278 other WCW wrestlers. Given the unpredictable nature of establishing stars, WCW's use of this particular defence may have been stronger than it would in another industry. Had the case gone to trial, WCW might have relied upon wrestlers' status as independent contractors. However, discriminatory practices in the workplace are prohibited by federal law, regardless of whether a person is classified as an independent contractor or employee. The discrimination lawsuit would be settled in 2003, with the defendants paying undisclosed sums to the plaintiffs. Like most cases involving a settlement, a non-disclosure agreement was attached, meaning the specifics could not be discussed. One of the plaintiffs, Harrison Norris Jr, aka Hardbody Harrison, found himself in federal court again, this time as a criminal defendant. In 2008, he was sentenced to a life sentence for his role in sex trafficking and forced laboring. Norris would claim he was running a wrestling camp for women. Ultimately, the lawsuit was not a case of exposing discrimination and racism in wrestling as much as holding an organization responsible for their wrongful actions. Racism and other bias continues to be a problem in wrestling today, with questionable portrayals based on stereotypes involving ethnicity, religion and gender. Whether or not this, in conjunction with discriminatory practice, leads to further lawsuits remains to be seen. Well guys, we hope you've enjoyed our part 2 look at WCW's racism lawsuit. What are your thoughts? Let us know in the comments below. We've got so many more topics to cover, so be sure to subscribe, hit the bell for immediate notifications of uploads, and I'll see you next time with some more wrestling content.